here immediately. This cafe is closed until further notice. Clear the room at once. How can you close me up? On what ground? I'm shocked, shocked to find that gambling is going on in here. You're winning, sir. Oh, thank you very much. Everybody out at once. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. We light this candle as a symbol of Christ the way. May the word sent from the God, the prophets, lead us to the way of salvation. The candle carried me here. Our Old Testament lesson for this morning is from Psalm 85. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet, Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. This is God's word for us. Thanks be to God. Mark's Gospel, the first chapter, the first eight verses. Mark writes these words. In the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the Kaiser appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sin. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. 
I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandal. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to our Lord Jesus Christ. And we hear in the scriptures that Pastor Barry will read to us in just a little bit about a man named John. John had lived in the desert. John was a man who was calling people to come to repentance, to turn away from their sin, and get ready for somebody really special who would be coming. I'm wondering if you've ever seen on television when there is an award show that people arrive and they walk down a red carpet. And that red carpet shows them the way to go to the room where they will have the award program. Well, when we think about that red carpet, it's preparing the way. It shows them the way that they should go. And that was John's job. He was preparing the people to come, to come to the River Jordan be baptized, to be ready for when Jesus should come. Most of the Christmas stories, we start with Jesus as a baby, but Luke starts his story with John, and John calls us to prepare the way. So how can we prepare the way? What is it that we can do? I don't think we're going to roll out a red carpet, but, but we can share the good news of Jesus. That's what gospel means, good news. And so we can share that good news of Jesus' love for all people, the people that we meet. The people who might be a little sad right now because of COVID, it's just wearing everybody down. But it will not last forever. There is hope because God always gives us hope. So when you see somebody who's feeling a bit down, share with them that God loves them and that things will get better. Let's have a prayer together. Gracious God, we thank you for your message that you call us to prepare the way. Help us to share your love with all who need so that they might have hope in this season of quiet. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Polite and courteous people that we are, we like to think that there are no stupid questions. There are. Humans have a pension for asking stupid questions. What child is this is one of them. We ask in ignorant wonderment, what child is this? And so we don't know. Of course we know. It's no secret. We've sung the carol, we've heard it sung scores of times, and we know all too well the story which inspired its composition. What child is this? Come on. We're about as surprised as Captain Renault from the classic movie Casablanca when he famously feigns disbelief by exclaiming, I'm shocked, shocked to know that gambling is going on in here. Remember that line? Now, composer William Dex certainly knows who the child is. So do the shepherds who visit, as they were informed just a short time before making their trek into town, informed by an unforgettable choral army of angels, no less. So do the magi know, who correctly read the signs in the heavens, and so does every Hebrew in Bethlehem know. Perfect least they should. God's prophets have been calling for the Messiah's arrival for hundreds of years. Folks must have some clue to his identity. Really, does, does anyone not know what child this is? Because for all the astonishment we allow when it comes to God and God's acts, God is not really one to totally catch us unaware. As noted, the Messiah and his new reign were not just subtly telegraphed or 
were, were mentioned on the QT, they were loudly predicted and proclaimed for centuries. You're giving plenty of advance notice is God's well-practiced MO. There was plenty of warning before ascending the great flood, right? Pharaoh and the Egyptians were admonished over the course of 10 plagues that God would act mightily to reverse 400 years of Hebrew bondage. The exile that removed God's people from their homeland after years of habitually thumbing their noses at God was announced by prophets again and again, as was the long-awaited restoration of Jerusalem at the exiles and seven decades later. God always makes promises in advance. And that's what promises are. And God always does what promises. The only caveat is that what God does is not according to our time. Take setting dates for the second coming as an example. Our track record in timing stinks. Thank you, Campbellites, Jehovah's Witnesses, our camping. And speaking of the second coming, isn't there a lot of conjecture about it right now during COVID time? A pandemic, by the way, which epidemiologists have expected for years. I mean, people are asking, is this the apocalypse? Are we living the book of Revelation? Are these end times? What did we do? You know, who's to blame for this mess? Will, will God be angry with us forever? The, the hand wringing psalmist panics. Now, I wouldn't be so rude and impolitic as to call these two questions. A lot of intelligent people are asking them. I do believe they're the wrong question. Take those questions of the who's to blame variety. The answers provoke a host of conspiracy theories about the virus. Why? It's the Chinese Communist Party. Why? It's Mr. Trump. Why? It's politically motivated leaders and their corrupt minions in the media and medicine and big pharma. And no doubt there are a thousand other ideas running around spreading themselves as easily as the virus itself, and in some ways just as dangerously, writes Bishop N.T. Wright in our Advent study. Even Dr. Fauci is the darling of half of the citizens one day until he says something that they don't like, which then makes him the darling of the other half of the citizens until he says something that they don't like, and so it goes. The poor guy. How about a little grace? That's not a stupid question. One thing, though, is for certain. It's always someone else who is to blame. Those people whose politics and lifestyles we don't see, they're the reason for this pandemic. They're the ones getting God so angry. So on questions. The answers are time. So, followers, let's resist the knee jerk reactions that come from the wrong question. Now, I certainly endorse an honest inquiry into the virus origins in order to achieve healthy solutions and, and pre prevent future missteps. But Really, nilly indictments? Fair, kind, reasonable, unhelpful. It's like Martha blaming Jesus for her brother Lazarus' death just because he didn't arrive in Bethany quickly enough. What? Was Jesus supposed to hijack the centurion's chariot to get there sooner? I mean, what did she expect? But I get it. I get it. When, when you're really upset, as Martha is, you just lash out unthinkingly. This is her beloved and only brother. Again, I get it. And Jesus is a convenient target. 
nationally, we blame the president. At home, hey, it's mom. At, at, at church, it's the pastor. In the, in the conference, it's the bishop. And in life, it's God. But blame Jesus? Really? It's a shame Martha wasn't around earlier in John's gospel. Because when people ask Jesus, who is the blame for a young man's blindness, he doesn't give in to their desire to name a culprit. Why, he didn't sin, neither did his parents. Jesus enlightens them, rather intolerant of their willingness to excuse. He adds that blindness isn't a punishment at all. Instead, it would be the occasion for God's glory. The occasion for God's glory. Hmm. That can frame things. You see, Jesus doesn't wallow in what's already done that cannot be undone. He doesn't obsess on the past. He is future-looking. The Jesus who comes into this world once and promises to come again is future-looking. Is that really a surprise? So don't focus on the hardships. Don't focus on the interpretations of the seeing signs of our time. Focus on Jesus. Don't engage that reproachful finger point, the simplistic speculation, the, the pointless argumentation. We disciples need to ask the right questions. It's not who's to blame, but what do we do? What do we do now? How can you and I, beloved children of God, disciples of Jesus Christ, serve and make a difference today and in the time ahead. That's productive. That's helpful. That's holy. Because when you get right down to it, if I were to ask you, if you wanted to do what God wants, well, inevitably, you would answer in the affirmative. Of course, of course you want to do what God wants. So then, let's prepare the way as our gospel lesson teaches. What Advent is, is all about, taking a pregnant pause to patiently ponder and prepare to act in a new way in this new day. Using Psalm 88 as inspiration, we can proceed forward in the world once we prepare our souls and lives for this time. With Christ, we begin working on our spirits inside then move out to the world and kingdom. Now, you know, we began this task last week, the first study of Advent. We did that by acknowledging our need to lament. And so we engaged the, the hard, unpleasant work of grieving all that we've lost and missed this year. Jesus wept before raising Lazarus. We're in good company when we were to. This week, then, we recognize that the populist approach of asking questions in order to assign blame is really not the way to advance the ball. But there is a way forward that asks questions that lead us to turn around our lives in a way that is healthy, that honors Christ by eliciting his kingdom and serves the need around us. But for that approach, we need to look to Jesus. Because the world's obviously failed approach is not doing that. So we disciples must. It's incumbent upon us to offer something better. His impelling spirit motivates compelling change inside, propelling us toward a change in the world outside. So friends, Bag the silly questions. Respond to Christ's call to unselfishly serve others in need, in deed, in need. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.